Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. Be sure to subscribe so we can get you these messages every single week. Have a great day. Well, no, no pressure, right? I got to move this because my OCD, I feel like Aerosmith's coming up. This morning, uh, you know, you almost preached it last week if you guys weren't here. Wow, it's a lot of people in here today, and there's a lot of green. You're all sinners. I'm just kidding. I'm just ki- It's funny because the first thing highlighted on my iPad today is green. That's hilarious. That was not intended. Joke's on me. Uh, last week, if you weren't here, he kind of preached a little bit on the prodigal son. And uh, do we have any prodigals in here if you're not ashamed to admit it? should all be raising your hands because we were all sinners and we all fell short. Um, but you were mentioning that, and I was worried that you are going to step all over my notes. So, uh, but as it were, and as you did, and I'll call you out about it, uh, too often when we talk about the prodigal son story in the, in the parable, we only focus on one of the characters. We only focus on the one that, that left and that... Uh, wasted his whole life away and squandered his money living recklessly, and we never focus on the rest of the characters in the story. Um, So today, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. I'm going to give you my title first, and then we're going to read three verses, but that's all I'm going to have you stand for because there's a lot that I'm going to get through, and I'm not going to have you stand for all of that. So today, the title of the message is Don't Miss the Party. Don't Miss the Party. And if we can't stand for the reading of the Word of God, we're going to be in Luke 15. Starting in the first verse, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. <laughs> but I'm not Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus told them this parable. Father, we thank you for the the worship that was, you are already in this place, and there's nothing we can do beyond now that gets any better than just experiencing you in the way that we already did. God, I pray that the message that you have given me does not return void. God, I am just a vessel, and I pray that it strikes at the hearts of the people in here as you used it to strike at the hearts of the people at the time that this was written. And everybody said... Amen. Don't miss the party. You may be seated. Thank you. So as, as we saw, the chapter began with Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors, but there was also the other party of the Pharisees. Now, I want you to take this because there's a lot to, to uh, explain today. That doesn't mean I'm going to go like super long. I know you guys, I'm, I'm long, long-winded, but I want you to put that in your pocket. The crowd that Jesus is speaking this parable to in Luke 15, there's the tax collectors, the sinners, and the Pharisees. Oh my. And if you notice, the one group is there, the tax collectors and the sinners. In verse 1, they were gathering around to hear Jesus. But the religious crowd was there for a different reason. They were there to undermine him. They wanted to point out what he was doing, what they thought that he was doing wrong. What he was doing was insane, how he was... Uh, having a meal with sinners and tax collectors. So one group is there to hear, the other is not. They've already made up their mind. But this sets the stage. There's three parables in here that Jesus tells in, in Luke 15. And this sets the stage for all three of the parables about God seeking the lost and heaven rejoicing when they are found. They rejoice. There's a party that gets thrown in heaven. But almost everyone in this day, to give you some context, almost everybody... Shocker, hated tax collectors. I know we love them nowadays. Um, But the Jews actually viewed them as traitors. They could search anything except a Roman lady. And anything that was not declared was subject to seizure. And actually in Egypt, (laughs) they were, I don't know why I laughed at that, so I'm sorry. But they were even known to sometimes beat up elderly ladies to try to learn where their tax-owing relatives are. Devil's fighting me again today. <clears throat> and then we have the Pharisees, the hyper-religious bunch. They were considered the godliest Judeans, 
that someone could normally meet, and they were actually contrasted with the tax collectors who were considered the ungodliest people that you could meet. And the Pharisees were incredibly meticulous in their interpretation of the law and in their eating habits because of it. Because it was generally viewed that when you had a meal with someone, you were establishing a covenant. You were establishing a friendship with someone. We see that today. And so by eating with tax collectors and sinners, they viewed it as Jesus endorsing them. But Jesus wasn't endorsing them. He was there to enlighten them. Jesus doesn't endorse your sin. He enlightens you to it. He brings it up to the surface and shines a line on it, so you're a light on it, so you're made aware of it, and you can turn and repent of it. But he wasn't just doing that for the sinners. He was doing it for the saints, if you will. And the problem is, it was a little bit warranted because Scripture warns of intimate fellowship with sinners. But the issue is that without God, they influence you. They'll drag you down. They'll lead you down the wrong path. They'll take you into bad habits, and they can lead you astray. But with God, you influence them. Because God, I said it before, God wants to use you for his story. He wants to work in you so he can work through you so that he can reach the lost that may be around you. And so in the first parable, we have the parable of the lost sheep. There's a hundred sheep. One goes astray. If you've been in Sunday school, I'm sure you've heard the story. One goes astray. The shepherd goes out to find it. He finds it, gets all excited, comes back, wants everybody to throw a party with him. And Jesus says, when something is lost and it is found, it's cause for celebration. Then he goes to the second parable with the 10 coins. A woman has 10 coins and she loses one. And some people think that this is talking about finances and money. And while this may be one aspect, it was actually um, coins used for a frontlet for a bride that was given to her by the bridegroom. It would be like today if you propose to someone and then your fiance lost their wedding ring or their engagement ring, you would lose your mind. And so it would be viewed that she was careless and she didn't you know, want to take care of it and it would be a really bad situation, or situation. So she was freaking out, she's crying, she's sweeping the house. And then she ends up finding it, same thing, celebrates it, gets all of her neighbors together, wants to throw a a party, and Jesus tells him again, something that is lost is cause for celebration. Helen, Helen, heaven, goodness, heaven throws a party. So he backs up the first parable by repeating the same line in the second parable. And he's trying to show these religious people, these Pharisees, why he is hanging around with the lost. And then we get to the parable of the lost son. This is different. We are now talking about people. We're not talking about animals and sheep. We're not talking about objects like coins. And this parable actually doesn't close in the same way. It's left a little bit open-ended because it is intended to strike at the listener's hearts because Jesus is making a point. And it is a long story. That's why I didn't want you guys to stand up. So starting in verse 11... Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up, went to his father. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Then the son said, the son said to him, sorry, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to, worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. 
So obviously we see that the pattern remains the same. Something is lost and there is a seeker recovering what is lost and there is a celebration. But now the perspective has shifted. We're not looking from the seeker's perspective. We're looking from the lost person's perspective. And we see that unlike the sheep and the coin, the prodigal son returns by his own choice. It is left up to him. In this parable, the son takes the initiative to return to the father. That is why this parable is focusing both on God's mercy, but also the need to repent. So he rebels, he returns, and he is restored. Everybody say rebels, returns, is restored. Just wanted to make sure you're awake. So the story opens. By revealing the characters, we see there's a father and there's two sons. For some of you that only recognize the prodigal son, you're like, whoa, didn't even know there was an elder brother. And judging by the context given, there was obviously a lot of land involved. The father would have been extremely wealthy. He would have been well-known and well-established. There's servants, there's livestock, there's robes, and there's riches. There's the fattened calf. And that was only uh, saved for celebrations, and it actually was enough to feed the entire village. So when he throws the party, the entire village would have been there. But as it were, the younger son is bored. He's tired of his life. And this is showing you that you can think you have everything in life that there is to offer, and you can still feel empty. You'll be tired, and you're feeling mundane of doing the same thing over and over again every day. And he just wants to go out and see the world. He wants to go out and try new things. He wants to go see new people. He wants to get out from the, under the eyes of his father. He wants to be able to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, with whomever he wants, and there's nobody around that he knows that can judge him and say anything about it. He wants what the father has, but not the father himself. So in verse 12, he tells the father, give me my share of the estate, Give me my share of the estate. Now, when we read this as a modern-day audience, we're just like, okay, yeah, whatever. But to the audience that Jesus is telling, this would have been absolutely ridiculous. This would have been unheard of. This is literally like me looking at my dad and saying, give me my inheritance now. I wish you were dead already. The son is essentially telling his father, I wish you were dead. Give me what what I'm owed. I want all that you have to give me, but I don't want you. I want it all right now. I wish you were dead. And this is literally, this is literally how we are in the world. This is exactly how the world is. Humanity wants everything that God has to offer. We want his riches. We want his mercy. We want his grace. We want his blessings. And we want the eternal life. We want to get to heaven, but we want to do it without God, of course. We don't want his eyes on us. We don't want to be, you know, following all the rules that he thinks he has for us. We want all of his blessings, but without what we perceive as burdens. This is why you see a lot of people just say that religion is a bunch of rules and the Bible and and every religion, they're all the same. They're just made up to control people. There's just a bunch of rules for the, the, the people that can't think for themselves and they just want to control everybody. This is actually, I looked it up. There was, uh, there's a study online where almost 70% of the people in the world uh, by a couple years ago, they believe in a God. Not the God, because if 70% of people believed in the one and only God, obviously the world would be an entirely different place. <clears throat> and what's really shocking is it goes on to say that there's more people that believe in heaven. I'm sorry, there's people that believe more in heaven than they believe in hell. Because obviously we want the good, but not the bad. This is one of the ways that Satan gets people to fall short, that, gets, that he gets them to fall off of the path. Because if he can get you to believe something, even if it's just slightly false, that can lead you further down the path and lead you further astray. If he can get you to believe anything falsely in life, he can get a hold of your life more. This literally ties back into Genesis, how when he told Eve, you know, surely you're not going to die. That's not what he said. And they didn't die immediately because they didn't die spiritually. They, or they didn't die physically. They died spiritually. And it opened up the way for them to die further down the road. But you can't have just the good without having a bad. You can't just believe in good without also believing in the bad. That's why there is a heaven and there is a hell. And the reality of the situation is it is entirely your choice on which one you get to go to. <clears throat> So the son, he says, give me everything that is mine. Break up your estate. 
Call 877-CASH-NOW. Call J.G. Wentworth. It's my money. I want it now. Give it to me now. So they would have been absolutely appalled. They're going to be expecting how the father is going to have anger at this child. He's going to pour out his wrath on the child. And he's probably going to beat the snot out of him because, you know, spare the rod and spoil the child. So beat your kids. But Jesus flips it on them. And he tells him how the father divides the property between them, and he lets him leave. This is showing them that there is the permission of free will to man, but it also shows the fact that God gives gifts. Oh, this is going to make some people mad. God gives gifts even to the unthankful hearts, the disobedient hearts. It is a testament to his unending love for us. Even those rejecting him, he still loves So the son takes all the money, and he packs up his bags, and he runs off to Las Vegas where he can do everything he wants with whoever he wants, whenever he wants, and nobody knows him there. And he can try everything under the sun, and he doesn't have to worry about being judged. He doesn't have to worry about his father. He doesn't have to worry about anything. This is literally like us when we try to go our own way. You see it how there's people all all the time now that we're seeking fame and we're seeking fortune. We just want to get rich. We want to be known. It used to be that, you know, celebrities were just the the people that we see on TV and the movie stars and, you know, your favorite band or uh, your favorite football, your baseball player or or soccer or whatever. Nowadays, you can, you know, have a, a YouTube account or a TikTok with a cell phone and be a social influencer. And as long as you're doing nothing but highlighting products for some company, because you have a bunch of followers, you can do whatever you want and you don't have to worry about a job. But you can go seeking anywhere that you want and you will find something. You can go wherever you want. You can seek anything you want and you will find something. But it is never, ever going to be who you truly are. Because until you actually seek God, you're just still a slave to sin. Until you find yourself in God, you're a slave to sin. And you will only find yourself, truly yourself, in his arms. And I can't stand it when people think that the Bible is boring. They think it's just this old history book. The Bible is not just a history book. It's not dead. It is the living. It is the active word of God. It is God-breathed. It is full of wonderful stories of loss and redemption and battles. There's a lady that stabs some dude with a tent peg. There's somebody that they're committing sexual immorality, and then Phineas comes and stabs them through the back with a spear that pins them to the ground. I mean, I don't know about y'all, because y'all watch like you know Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings or whatever else is on TV now. And uh, all that stuff is based off of, well, loosely based. We'll just say they took what God wrote and actually what happened, and then they twist it for fantasy because they want us to believe anything else other than the word of God. But it is active, and it is exciting. And it is literally about the brokenness of humanity and our desperate plea, plea to our creator who sends his son who came down from heaven and pulls us up out of our pit so that we may enjoy life the way that he intended it from the very beginning. So the younger brother gets bored, and when you're restless, you're going to be reckless. You're going to see this now with kids all the time when they have nothing to do and they get bored because they don't know how to play outside anymore, and if you take away their tablet, they're going to lose their mind, and then they're going to get in with the wrong crowd, and then they're just going to start you know, vandalizing and destructing property and all those kinds of fun things. But when we get restless, we get reckless. We start to rebel, and we still do this with God. We still think we can do things our own way, just like when he tells us to do something and we dig our heels in the sand because we don't want to get embarrassed or we worry about how people think about us. And we rebel and we rebel and we rebel, but rebellion ultimately leads to the hell you're in. So this son, he had it all. He had a big house, Lots of land, money, servants. He had everything provided for. And yeah, he still had some work to do. He still had a little bit of a job. But was it as bad as what happens after he left everything behind? He runs away. He tries everything. He squanders his wealth in wild living. He throws parties and has all kinds of people over. And celebrities would have been hanging out with him. And he was living the dream, the American dream. He's drinking till he's blacked out. He's got a different girl in his bed every night, maybe more than one every night. And he's living it up in debauchery until it's all that's gone. And all he's left with is a depression. 
And so many people in society today will have you believe that that is the American dream, just doing you, living wild and free, trying everything under the sun, all the drugs and drinking and sex that you can imagine, not having a job to work anymore, just getting free stuff from the government and not having to do anything at all with your life except for whatever you do. Just be you. And notice that in the story and in your life, As long as you're living that way, you have an abundance of friends. Everybody's around when the going is good. And I'm sure while he was living it up, there was all sorts of people who he would have been calling friends. Because if you've got money to throw around, it can throw and have wild parties. People are always going to show up because why not? You're footing the bill. You're giving them free food. You're giving them free drugs. You're giving them free alcohol. This dude, he gave them prostitutes. He gives them a place to crash. They'll always show up for that way of living. And they'll call you your friends until, as long as they have something they can get from you. But where do they go when everything falls apart? Where do they go? Who's in your corner when life comes at you and you hit the bottom? Where do they all go? Because it says a famine hit the land after he spent everything. See, he was so used to daddy's money that he didn't know how to put anything in the bank and save it up. And daddy wasn't there for him anymore. And he didn't have the brain power in order to do anything. So he begins to be in need and everything fell apart and everyone disappears. Because when life hits you and everyone in your life has split away from you, they weren't there for you, for who you were or who you are. They were there for what you had and what you have. So he hits rock bottom. He hits rock bottom and he has to hire himself out to feed pigs. I know that sounds whatever nowadays, but you have to realize that Jews viewed pigs as unclean. So now, instead of just falling somewhere, he's at the lowest point of his life, at a point of humiliation because he's having to do something that he knows is completely unclean. He's lost his house, he's lost his family, now he's lonely, and he's got a terrible job, and he's so hungry that he's trying to eat what the pigs are eating. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you're feeling crushed, and you're disconnected from your family and you're struggling to make ends meet and no one around you seems to even know it because you're hiding it behind your smile but inside you're completely empty and you feel so dead you feel so tired and maybe you're thinking this is it life is over but the story is never over until it actually is over you're not dead until God is done because as we see in this story in verse 17 the son came to his senses and he says I got to get back to my father I've got to get back there He had so much that his servants were provided for, and I'm out here starving and eating the pods that the pigs eat. Pigs eat anything. I'm not condoning this, but I'm pretty sure if you throw a dead body or something in a pig pig pen, they only don't eat the fingernails. They eat bones? They eat bones. All they do is not eat the fingernails, which is crazy because when we vacuum the building every week, there's fingernails all over the floor. But if you notice, not only were the servants provided for, they were provided for so abundantly that they have food to spare. This dad is so rich that in the famine, his servants had enough food that they could literally waste it. And the son would have known this. That's why he wants to go back. He would have known this while he was there. But while he was there, he was too blind to see it because Satan limits your sight to the blessings that you already have. He attacks your contentment in order to attack your commitment. Because if he can get you to worry about what you don't have instead of what you do have, you'll turn away and run away from God. This is why people run away. They quit being content with God and what he has given them, and they look for more. But more is a feeling that never truly gets filled until it is more of God. When you have more possessions, you're going to have more bills. When you have more money, you're going to have more problems. And you go seeking the next thing that brings more, the next tithe, something that gets you more high, something that gets you more drunk. You want to have more sex, so you'll have more self-worth, as the world would call it. And you're seeking more from people that they can't provide because ultimately they are just as empty as you are. You're seeking more from a world that doesn't have anything to give you to sustain you or to fill you, and you're wanting your cup to overflow from a well that has already gone dry and will never be able to pour something into your life. When the well is dried up, all that can be poured into you is dust. All that can be poured into you is death. All that can be poured into you is destruction. And when you are wanting to drink from a well that doesn't have water and it only has waste, you're going to find that you're always 
thirsty. You're going to find that you're always left feeling empty. You're going to find that you're always left feeling broken. You're going to find that you will always be left feeling famished. You will find that everything the world has to try to fill your void will never truly fill the hole that is inside of you, and it will never bring you happiness because all it does is make a bigger hole. Every time you go to the world, it doesn't give you anything. It takes something more from you. And you're craving something, but you can't quite put your finger on it. But the world keeps pulling you back, and it keeps pulling you back and says, this time it'll work. The enemy says, you don't, you don't need anything back there with your family. You don't, you don't need your father. You don't need to go back home. Look how he, he let you leave. Because wouldn't a loving father, would a loving father let you leave? Or would he have tried to talk some sense into you? Wouldn't he have tried to stop you? He probably just wanted you gone so that he could be with your older brother because he always does everything right. You're, you're the screw up. You're the one that just messes everything up under the sun and you can't do anything right. So he, he let you leave. So come on, have another drink. Take another toke. Hit another line. Take another pill. Can't wait for this one to get on the internet again. You'll feel better afterwards as long as you sink a little bit deeper. And eventually you get to the bottom of the well of the world and you find out the truth. There's nothing down there. And it is so dark, and it's so dry, like my mouth. And there's only dirt down there, and there's only bones down here. And you're thinking, I must not be the only one that fell this far. I must not be the only one that has hit rock bottom. I can't be the only one to have thrown everything away, everything that mattered. And I threw it all away. But I don't want to stay here. I don't want to die like this. So church... And to the prodigal, when you are at the bottom of your pit and when the darkness is so thick that you can feel it pressing around you, you need to know that God is right there saying, I know this is a mess and you're already on your knees. So while you're down there, why don't you just cry out to me? If you will just trust me, if you will just listen to me, I will pull you out of this pit. Turn your face to me, turn your heart to me, and let me lift you. Let me show you a different well. Let me show you a different way. His name is Jesus. He is the only way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the well that never runs dry. Drink from him and you will never be thirsty. Drink from him and you will always be satisfied. Drink from him and you will be made whole again. Drink from him and he is the only thing, the only one that can sustain you. Drink from him because he will never leave you. Drink from him because you don't have to try to perform anything else now. He's already done it for you. I've already made the sacrifice for you. Just trust in God and he will show you. Just go back to him. And so the son comes to his senses, and in verse 18, he starts prepping his speech. He says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up, and he went to his father. And I imagine the entire time that he's on his way back, because he was in a distant land. You know, I know when we read the Bible, we have like no concept of time, so... We think of it's like a TV show, and it's like, oh, he's there. No, the entire time he's going, and he's probably running over his speech in his head and thinking and moving it around and trying to get it correct. God, you know, Father, I'm I'm not worthy. Just if I can do this, if I can do that, if I can if I can get home, if I can just come to you, I, I'll, I'll pay you back. I'll pay you back. Just make me like a servant. You don't have to do anything else. I don't. I'm not even want to be your son anymore. Just make me like a servant. And I'll pay you back. I know I'm never going to be able to do it, but I will pay you all of it back. I will work as a servant for the rest of my life because he has now realized how far he has come. He's realized how far he has fallen and he is hoping and he is praying and he is wondering if he can just be a servant back home. And it might not be the best situation, but at least he'll be back home. Please, just let me in. And the son rehearses his speech you put verse 20 on the screens, please? And he says that he got up and he went to his father. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son. He ran. This is completely unheard of. Even today, 
where we don't know what cardio is, to the audience that Jesus is speaking, they can't, they can't fathom this. This son has completely disgraced his entire family. He's rejected his people by going to a distant land because he didn't want to be around them. He disrespected his father. And now this father is running to the son to embrace him. In their culture, it was completely undignified for an older man to run. But this dramatic reunion takes precedence over dignity. See, the reunion mattered more than his reputation. And Jesus is the friend of sinners because your redemption matters so much more than his reputation. Jesus is the friend of sinners because your redemption matters so much more than his reputation. He knows people hate him. He knows that they're going to speak against him. He knows how they twist his words. He knows how they blaspheme him. And one day he will dish out his righteous judgment. But in the meantime, he just wants to see you come home. He is not ashamed of you. He's not afraid to be seen with you. He's proud of you. He's proud to be with you. He's proud to be in you. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. His blood has already washed you clean. He's not afraid of your deepest sin. He's not afraid of your darkest moments. His grace is sufficient for you and his power is made perfect in your weakness. He came down from his throne for you. He became a man for you. He made himself of no reputation in order to take the form of a servant and bear the weight of your sins on the cross so that you can stand blameless before him in his sight. He just wants to see you come home back into the father's arms. And we see this, we see this in verse 21. Jesus shows us the father embraces his son and the son, father, I've sinned against you in heaven and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, verse 22, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. He can't even get to the part of wanting to be a servant because the father cuts him off to throw a party because he's already accepted. He's already forgiven. We get so wrapped up in performance-based living that we never truly live because we never feel like we're gonna live up to the standard. We'll never walk without some type of fault. But Jesus shows us it's not about performance. He already handled the part. It's not performance-based living. It is relationship-based redemption. Our Father is already running to us with arms wide open the minute we accept his Son as our Savior and he says, it is finished. There's nothing to strive for because he has already saved us. It was never, it was never the son's words that mattered to the father. It was his heart change. It was his desire, his own desire to return, not his speech. He recognized his need for redemption and he humbled himself to return to the father's arms. And normally, this is where a lot of preachers would end it because, whoo, the prodigal son is back. You're saved. Awesome. We love you. Pick up some coffee and a free Bible on the way out. But to the audience that Jesus was speaking, it was about so much more than just the prodigal son. It was about more than the tax collectors and the sinners. Everyone's always talking about it, but that's not who it's truly about. The elder brother, the Pharisees, the younger brother was for the lost, the prodigal, the lost, the wayward heart, the wayward son, the despised tax collectors and the sinners. But the other part of the audience was the other son, the Pharisees, the elder brother. It says in verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants one of the servants, and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. 
But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the, cat, the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. This is, that's literally true, because when he divided the estate, the remaining two-thirds were the elder brothers. Verse 32, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You look, the elder brother, he didn't even want to go inside. He walked up, heard the party going on, refuses to go in. And he literally, he's like a child. He calls somebody to go over there. You go tell them that I said, come out here and let me know what's going on. You know, because some people, they just, they just look for things to be mad about. And this was the Pharisees. This was the, the hyper-religious crowd that couldn't fathom the idea that the Gentiles were being preached to and accepted. This was the crowd that causes so much church hurt to the people that end up becoming a prodigal because they go to church and they get judged completely out of their seat and reject God because of the heart of the elder brother. These are the people that would rather gossip about you in church. The people who <laughs> didn't wear green and are upset because you did wear green. <laughs> These are the people that literally get upset over outfits in church. Instead of meeting someone where they're at like Jesus does, like Jesus did. And loving them like Jesus did. And, you know, I'm super proud when I read... Uh, reviews and stuff online and comments from people that have come here and they say how accepted they felt and how a lot of people met them at the door and they talked to them and they felt like they were part of a family. So props to you guys, family, for welcoming people that come in here. This is a judgment-free zone. And the father, the father embarrasses himself again. First he ran because that was undignified. And now everybody's at the house and they're throwing a party for the younger son. But the elder brother refuses to come in, so he has to come outside. The elder brother, by refusing to come in, has made this family dispute completely public. Real housewives of Judea, whatever it was, <laughs> that kind of thing. We're all talking about them. Everybody inside's like, do you see what's going on? Like, oh, the sun's not coming in. I wonder what's happening. And again, the listeners of this story... They would have been looking for the wrath of the father, the anger of the father. They would have look, been looking for how the father was going to discipline this son for rejecting to come in and refusing to come in and disrespecting the family. But instead, he accepts this humili humiliation in order to meet the elder son outside and come and beg him to come inside to join the party. See, normally... The elder brother would have already been there to help celebrate and reconcile, reconcile with the father and the younger brother, but this story is aimed at the self-righteous critics. Jesus was showing them it wasn't just about the wayward son who was lost. The hyper-religious, self-righteous, goody-two-shoes folks who have all their hearts just as far from the father as the younger brother did. The Pharisees, and even some people today, believe more in what you do than who you serve. We saw it on the one reel where somebody would refuse to preach to a drunk person unless they sobered up. I haven't read a single time in the Bible where someone came up to Jesus and he said, nah, <laughs> not until you're clean. Oh, you can't walk? Come back with a wheelchair and we'll talk. They believed, the Pharisees believed, that by keeping the law and following the law to a T, that that's what would save them. Their hearts were just as far from God as the prodigal son because they believed that they can be their own savior as long as they follow the rules. And notice, when he refused to go in, he doesn't respect his father. He doesn't say, Father, look. He just says, look, all these years I've been here. Why does he get a celebration and I don't? And he shows his heart. He shows his mindset when he says that he's been slaving. He can't even respect his dad enough to call him a dad or call him a father. And now he says that he's been a slave the entire time he's been with the father, the entire time he's been there. And by coming home, 
The younger son has now became an heir again. He's welcome back in. So the wealth of the father has already been diminished. And the problem with the older brother is mad because he thinks now the wealth is going to be diminished even further, and he's going to have a smaller share. And he doesn't even care that the brother's home. He never calls him his brother. He never even calls him your son. He says, this son of yours. His focus has never been on the father or his family. His focus has only been on following the rules and waiting for a reward. He's only worried about the reward, not the redemption. He wanted what the father had, but not the father himself. Exactly the same as the younger brother. He didn't want to celebrate with them. He says he wants to celebrate with his friends, with a goat, because the fattened calf would have had the entire village there. But he says he wants a young goat for a celebration with his friends, because he wants to only celebrate people that he knows and not everyone else that's around, only the people that he picks and the people that he likes to hang out with. Only the people who are already inside the church and live exactly the way that he did and the same types of things that he thought. Only those who wear suits to church because they think that's the only way to dress and how dare somebody come inside looking any different. And oh Lord, the humanity, if somebody came in still drunk or high from the club the night before, but they felt God pulling at their heart and they knew that they needed a heart change. Nope. He just wants to celebrate with his friends about his achievements and only those who go to this certain denomination or this certain church and only those who sing hymns and only those who think that worship has to be exactly how they imagine worship is supposed to be, even though in reality, it's about God and what is deemed worthy to his ears. There's nothing wrong with hymns and there's nothing wrong with contemporary worship music. And if you don't like it, great, because it is not about you. It's about God. And if you refuse to worship, if you refuse to worship solely on because you don't like the song or you don't like how it sounds or it's too loud, you're making it about yourself and you are rejecting your duty, your oblig, I don't even want to call it an obligation, but we're created for worship. So we should be worshiping. And by you using any excuses, not worship. You're rejecting God of his worthiness. You're rejecting God of the worship that you owe him because he came and died for you. You're making it about yourself and and not about your creator. And you need to be careful that you're not worshiping the worship. He only wanted to celebrate with those that he thought was worthy. Only those, those people that are like, oh, the gospel needs to be preached like this. Why do we need all these lights and the drums and the keyboard? What happened to just preaching the gospel? Have you guys heard that famous line before? What happened to just preaching the gospel? Why can't we just preach the gospel? The problem with that is, what's your definition of the gospel? Are we going to just talk about the red letters of Jesus? Are we going to have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Are we going to reject Paul and his teachings? Are we going to include Paul and his teachings do we negate the Old Testament because we're you know, under the new covenant of the New Testament? See, the reality is when somebody says what happened to just preaching the gospel, what they're really saying is, I want you to preach the gospel my way that tickles my ears instead of transforming my heart. The problem with the elder brother and who he represents is his heart is actually in a more dangerous position than the prodigal son is. Because he doesn't realize how far he is. He doesn't realize how hard his heart is. And church, don't let your old heart be a cold heart. Don't judge someone different than you when they come in the door. Don't judge someone when they don't dress like you or talk like you or worship like you. You have no idea what someone else has been through or what they're going through still. If they want to move around in worship and you can't follow them, I don't even know why you're watching them, but don't you dare tell them not to dance like David. And I am, I am so tired of passionless praise and worship that looks more like we're just waiting for it to get over with. We serve a God who sent down his son to live like one of us and be treated like filth, to be treated like crap. And the best thing that we can do is give them a golf clap on Sundays and say, see you next week, preacher. When's the next food truck? 
He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our lives. He is worthy of our finances. He is worthy of all that you are because he first gave you all that he was. We have got to stop having boring churches and we need to start having burning churches. Churches that burn for Jesus. Churches that burn for worship. Churches that burn for praise. Churches that burn for the lost. Churches that burn for their community. Churches that burn to seek out the people and bring them back to the arms of the Father so that they are not spending their eternity burning for the wrong reasons. And if it offends you that the younger crowd dresses different when they come to church, good. If it offends you that the worship that we play and listen to doesn't sound like a 1920s piano and the red hymnal book with the same stanzas over and over again, turn to page 93, Julie's going to sing this song this Sunday, good. If it offends you that people don't have it all together when they come in this building and it might take just a little bit longer than you think for Jesus to work it all out, good. If it offends you that we are going to use every single social media platform, and yes, that does include TikTok, good. I looked it up because everybody's like, oh, TikTok is the devil. Gen Z, Gen Z is not on Facebook. You and your grandma are on Facebook (laughs) sharing recipes about a duck cake and looking up stuff from Bluey. The young crowd is using YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and one more that I can't remember, but it's not Facebook. And I can't stay... I am exactly... I am going to put every part of this church as close to the gates of hell as completely possible so that we can stop somebody from going on their way in and pull them back and plant a seed with the gospel in their life so that God can do what he needs to do in their life. You can hate on it all you want, but let's remove every church from every social media platform and what happens? It's an echo chamber of debauchery and inhumanity and good God, your 12-year-old's on there and there's probably some pornography that's on there that you don't know about. Do you even check what they look at anymore? Is your screen time more than your scripture time? Whoops. Is your screen time more than your scripture time? I, 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 I'm not going to understand it because we need to be saving people. We need to be planting seeds We need to be seeking the lost. And I hope this offends you because the Bible is just as offensive. If you have not gotten to the part yet that the Bible makes you feel a little bit funky inside and it's kind of making you feel like a little bit of a mess, you're either not reading it at all or you're avoiding the parts that make you feel like you've got something that you need to get fixed on. You cannot be an elder brother and think that you've got it all good. You cannot avoid the offensiveness of the word of God. I hope it offends you because if it offends you, then the Holy Spirit is convicting you. You need a heart change. And the elder brother needed a heart change. His heart was cold because he thought that he was owed something by the father because he felt that he never messed up. And that's the problem with the elder brother. That's why it's so much more dangerous. They don't see how wrong they are because they're too focused on doing it right. And when someone believes that God favors them more because of their doctrine or their worship or their behavior, they're going to be hostile towards those who don't live in the same way. That's what Tim Keller said. He says it best that their self-righteousness hides under the claim that they are only opposing the enemies of God. The elder brother is trapped by bitterness because he cannot fathom that he himself is a sinner or being in the company of sinners or being related to a sinner. That's why he doesn't call his brother a brother. He says, this son of yours, he can't fathom the fact that his heart is just as far from God. And it is impossible 
for you to forgive someone if you feel superior to them. Jesus was giving this article, or this parable to an audience of despised sinners and self-centered righteous people. And he's showing them, and hopefully I've done a good enough job of showing you today, that they are two sides of the same coin. One was running from God. One was trying to go his own way, thinking it was a better way. And probably 90% of us or more can relate to the younger brother, that we've left the church, that we have gone outside, we have tried everything, we've drank every weekend, but you know, this is the South, so we can get drunk on Saturday and show up to church on Sunday because that's how we were raised. But just because we were raised in it doesn't mean we truly believe in it. And then there's the elder brother, the other side of the coin, the one that felt that he doesn't need God and he doesn't need the Father as long as he follows the rules. He'll get the reward as long as he checks the boxes, but he didn't want a relationship with the Father. And Jesus closes this parable in a similar way by showing that what was lost and was now found needs to be celebrated. But if you look, it ends open-ended. He doesn't bring up like the other two where he says, verse seven, I tell you that in the same way there will be more, more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And in verse 10, the next parable, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And verse 32 He's still speaking as the father in the parable, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. He ends open-ended because it is an invitation to his audience, which included his enemies. These Pharisees, shortly after this, next week, apparently, if you forget your calendar, they were going to move him to be crucified and attack him. He was showing them, this is about you. You think you're better than the other brother, but you're just as far. And he is pleading with them to get them to realize that they are in danger of missing the party. They are in danger of missing the celebration because they are refusing to forgive the other side and come inside. They're so focused on obeying the rules that they reject the Redeemer. They want religion, but not relationship. See, religion religion operates on the pinnacle of, I obey, so I am therefore accepted by God. But the gospel, the gospel is this, I am accepted by God through the work of Jesus, now I will obey. Jesus paid it all, so we don't have to. Yeah. And every sinner saved, every time, there's a party in heaven. Amen. The lost are found, and that is so much cause for celebration. Yes. But there are people who would rather the rules be more strict, who would rather a certain group of people only be the ones allowed in. Only a little group can join the kingdom. They would rather it look more like a rich, gated community social club instead of it being one giant family in Christ. Most of us are familiar with the story of the prodigal son and we celebrate their return. This church exists so that people far from God will return to the arms of the Father. But most often we neglect the hard heart of the elder brother who is refusing to come in. And if that is you today, I have to warn you, you are in danger of missing the party. There will come a day when the invitation is not sent out anymore. And the door, the door will be shut. And those inside 
will celebrate eternally with the Father. But those who refuse to come in will be denied entrance. And I don't want anyone to miss that opportunity. Uh, my uncle sent me something last night, completely, <clears throat> completely random. Uh, and it was a reel on these three parables. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. I'm preaching on that tomorrow. And he said sweet, but he spelled it wrong. Uh, but in this video, the preacher was relating the parables in different ways than I have today. God speaks to us in, uh, in different ways, but it's the same message. If you watch multiple preachers, you can kind of pick out who God is truly speaking to because the messages are all interconnected, even though they're getting preached at the same time because it's one voice coming out. So for his sermon, he mentioned how the first parable of the sheep represents property. The man chased it and went to get his property back. And the second parable with the coins, he relates to finances. Now, obviously, I told you that was the bridegroom, and it was like, or the bride front lip. But it could represent finances. It doesn't mention that she had a husband in there, so that could have been a significant portion of her wage. And she goes to find it. So we have property and we have finances. And then the final parable, we have people. And how often if we lose something and we lose our property, do we move heaven and earth to go find it and regain it? If you lose your keys, you're losing your mind trying to find your keys. Or finances, you lose your job. And I have been there and had to put bills on credit cards and you will move heaven and earth trying to regain your finances and trying to replace what is lost and we move everything under the sun to regain our property and we move everything under the sun to regain our finances but how often do we lift a single finger to go retrieve a lost soul how often do you get the tug at work or in the grocery store to talk to someone and speak to them and pray for them but you get too fearful and you give in to the spirit of fear instead of rejecting it and standing boldly with God. And you might think, well, I don't know enough, so I wouldn't even know what to say. But the Holy Spirit is always there. He is the helper. He will put the words in your mouth. How often, church, How many people are burning right now because we squandered the opportunity to speak to them about their eternity? That is a humbling and terrifying thought. But we give in to it far too often. And whether you are a prodigal today, you are welcome home. And if you are an elder brother and you are so mad at me that you haven't listened to a single word that I said because you think I'm completely wrong or you're so mad that I wore a green t-shirt or my knuckles have tattoos on them because some verse in Leviticus that you don't even understand the reality of makes you think that the blood of Jesus can't cover some ink. Whether you are two sides of those coins, in a minute they're going to to sing, to sing one more song. And I invite you, there will be altar workers that will come and pray for you and lay it all down at his feet. We accept you. Jesus accepts you. That does not mean we tolerate sin and it doesn't mean Jesus tolerates sin. He calls for your repentance. Repentance is not just uh, regret for the consequences of getting called out and found out. Repentance is turning away from it, 
not just asking for forgiveness. And it doesn't mean you will have it all together immediately. You'll probably still cuss somebody out when you pull out on a 207 because the traffic is getting absolutely ridiculous now. But Jesus will transform you from the inside out. But he has to get in there first. And if you are the elder brother, don't miss the party. Don't miss the party. You can't check the boxes and think that you've got it all together. And as long as you live good and judge yourself by your performance to the neighbor in your seat, that means you get into heaven. You are so much in danger of missing it. And God wants you home just as much as the younger brother. If everybody can stand up, I want to give us an opportunity today <clears throat> to say a prayer. Some people will get upset because they think that the sinner's prayer doesn't mean anything. Um, and they think that, you know, just by saying it, that uh, you'll find all kinds of videos on YouTube about churches that say the sinner's prayer at every service, how they're leading all these people into hell because just because you say it doesn't mean you believe it. Uh, it's not a magical prayer that just gets you into heaven but it is giving you an opportunity to follow the Bible and believe the Bible. And it tells you that when you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is your savior, savior, you are redeemed. You are accepted into the kingdom, no matter how you look or how you act. It doesn't mean stay willingly in sin. But when you believe your need for a savior, he will change your heart. He will transform your heart. In the minute you truly believe and confess that with your mouth, there is a party and a celebration in heaven resounding. So today, if we can bow our heads and close our eyes and everybody repeat it after me. If you've said it before, if it's your first time or you just want to rededicate yourself, <clears throat> we can heavenly father I understand my sin and my need for a savior I thank you Jesus that you left heaven and came down to die for me I thank you that you rose again so that I may rise and spend eternity with you. Come into my heart and transform me. Amen. In a minute, they'll play um, and come up and, and, get, and seek prayer. And if there's anybody in here that needs a Bible, we have plenty of Bibles to give out. I'm not asking you to buy one. But if you need one, we have them for you. I want to make sure everybody has the Word of God. And I, I thank you, and I, I pray that you come up and you seek the comfort that you need. You seek the prayer that you need, and you seek the Father that you need. He just wants you to come home. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's message. If you did, make sure that you share and subscribe so that we can get you these sermons as soon as they are available. I'd like to take a moment and thank everyone that's a part of the family. Whether you serve with us or give financially, it's because of you that we are able to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus. If you have any questions or would like to get more involved, click the link in the description. Thank you. Have a blessed week.